This audio recording is from the Practical Works of Richard Baxter, Select Treatises. It is published by Hendrickson, and its first printing is in October of 2010. The particular treatise I'll be reading can be found on page 645. It is entitled Directions to Weak Christians for Their Establishment, Growth, and Perseverance. And while I had originally found this work on digitalpuritan.net and I had converted the file to be readable on my Kindle, I had found the work uh, profitable to me that I had actually purchased his work from Hendrickson, but it was on Reformation Heritage. Uh, this will be a rather long recording, so I, I don't expect everyone to listen to it, but uh, if you find it a blessing to you, or if it is particularly needful for you, then Godspeed. And I'm also going to read the preface of the work because it is by the author himself, so therefore I think it will be rather useful. Preface. If the reader will but peruse these directions unpartially and read them, as he doth the prescriptions of his physicians, which are not written merely to be read, but must be daily practiced, whatever it costs him as he loves his life, then I make no doubt, notwithstanding the weakness of the composition, but it may further the cure of his spiritual weaknesses and distempers, and of the consequent troubles and losses of others and himself. I hope I shall not meet with many besides malignant hypocrites, who will be so impenitent and peevish as to fly in the face of the reprover and director, and say that I open the nakedness of many servants of Christ to the reproach and dishonor of religion. I have told you from the word of God that it is God's way, and must be ours, to lay the just dishonor upon the sinner, that it may not fall upon religion and on God, and that the defending or excusing of odious sins and tenderness of the persons who committed them is the surest and worst way to bring dishonor, first or last, both upon religion and on them. A Noah, a Lot, a David, a Solomon, a Peter, and the like shall be dishonored by God in the divine record to all ages that God may not be more dishonored by them. The truly penitent are willing that it should be so, and account their honor a very cheap sacrifice to offer up to the honor of religion which they have wronged. Till you come to this, you come short of true repentance. He that defends his open sin, unless he could deny the fact, doth as much as say, God likes it. Christ bids me to do it. The scripture is for it, or not against it. Religion taught it me, or doth not forbid it me. The godly allow it, and will do the like. And what can be said? What is more blasphemously against God, or more injuriously against religion, the scriptures and the saints? But he that confesses his sin, doth as good as say, Lay all the blame on me, for I deserve it, and not on God, on Christ, on scripture, on religion, or on the servants of God. For I learned it not from any of them, nor was encouraged to it by them. None are greater enemies to it than they. If I had hearkened unto them, I had done otherwise. It is one of the chief reasons why repentance is so necessary, because it justifies God and holiness. Alas! It is too late to talk of concealing those weaknesses and crimes of Christians which are so visible before all the world, which have had such public effects upon churches, kingdoms, and states, which have kept almost all the Christian churches in a torn and bleeding woeful state for so many hundred years to this present day, which have separated the churches of the East and West and defiled both, and have drawn so much blood in Christian countries, and keep us yet like distracted persons, gazing strangely at our nearest friends, and running away by peevish separation, from our brethren, with whom we must live in heaven, and mistakenly using those as enemies, with whom, if we are Christians, as we profess, we are united in the same head, and by the same Spirit, which is a Spirit of love. In a word, 
when our faults are so conspicuous as to harden infidels, heathens, and the ungodly, and to hinder the conversion of the world, and when they sound so loud in the mouths of our common reproaching enemies, and when they have contracted so much malignity as to refuse a cure by such wars, divisions, church desolations, plagues and flames, as has been seen, it is then too late to say to the preachers of repentance, Be silent, lest you open the nakedness of Christians and disgrace religion in the church. We must not be silent, lest we disgrace religion and the church to save the credit of sinners. Whoever reads the Holy Scriptures and ever understood the Christian faith must needs know that nothing in all the world is so much against every one of our errors and evil deeds. It is only for lack of more religion that any professors of religion miscarry. Nothing but the doctrine of Christianity and godliness did at first destroy the reign of their sin, and nothing else can subdue the rest and finish the cure. It is no disgrace to life that so many men's lives are burdensome with sickness, which the dead are not troubled with, nor is it any disgrace to the learning that scholars, for lack of more learning, have troubled the world with their contentious disputes, nor is it any disgrace to reason that men's different reasons, for lack of more reason, doth set the world together by the ears. We can never magnify you enough, as you are Christians and godly, unless we should ascribe more to you than your bounteous Lord hath given you, who hath made you little lower than angels, and crowned you with glory and honor. But your sins are so much the more odious, as they are brought so near the holy presence, and as they are aggravated by greater mercies and professions. And God is so far from being reconciled, or reconcilable to any one of them. And though he see not such iniquity in Jacob, as is in the heathens and the ungodly, because it is not in them to be seen, yet he sees more aggravated iniquity in such sins as you commit, in many respects, than in the heathens. That which is our common trouble is that you hurt not yourselves alone by your iniquities. Families are hurt by them. Neighbors are hurt by them. Churches are distracted by them. Kingdoms are afflicted by them. And thousands of blind sinners are hardened and everlastingly undone by them. The ignorant husband saith, I will never follow sermons, nor scriptures, nor be so religious while I see my wife, who makes so much ado with religion, to be as peevish and discontented, foul-tongued and unkind, contemptuous and disobedient as those that have no religion. The master who is profane saith, I like not your religion, when that servant, which most professes religion in my house, is as lazy, as negligent, and surly, as ready to dishonor me, and answer again, and as proud of his little knowledge as those that have no religion at all. The like, I might say, of all other relations. All the dishonor that this casts upon grace is that you have too little of it. And it is so weak in you that its victory over your flesh and passions is lamentably imperfect. A servant, hearing a high commendation of a gentleman, that he was of extraordinary wisdom, godliness, bounty, patience, affability, and what not, did think with himself, How happy a man were I if I could but dwell in this man's house, which at last he procured but ere long went away. His friend meeting him asked him how he came so quickly to forsake his happiness. Did not his master prove as was reported? He answered yes, and better than report could make him, or I could ever have believed. But though my master was so good, my mistress was so unreasonable, clamorous and cruel, that she would beat us, and there was no living with her. So faith, I hope, is the master in your hearts, and that 
is as good as can be well believed. But the flesh is mistress, which should be but a servant. And that makes such troublesome work with some of you, that some quiet-natured infidels are less vexatious companions than you. Nay, and I wonder if you can be very confident of your own sincerity, as long as such fleshly vices and headstrong passions keep up the power of a mistress in you. I wonder if you do not fear, lest, as a woman said, I will call my husband Lord with Sarah, if I may have my will fulfilled, so grace and faith should have no more than the regent titles, while your flesh hath so much of its will fulfilled. I know too many cheat themselves into comfort with the false opinion, that because they have a party in them that strives against their sins, it is a certain sign that they have the spirit and are sanctified, though the flesh even in the main doth get the victory. And I know many that have sincerity indeed, who yet have many a foil by boisterous passions and fleshly inclinations. But I am sure till you know which party is predominant and truly bears the governing sway, you can never know whether you are sincere. As once a servant, when his master and mistress were fighting, answered one at the door who desired to speak with the master of the house, You must stay till I see who gets the better before I can tell you who is the master of the house. So I truly fear. The conflict is so hard with many Christians between the spirit and the flesh, and holds them so long in a doubtful state, and sense, passion, unbelief, and pride and worldliness, and selfishness prevail so much, that they may stay with themselves a great while before they can be well resolved which is master. For, to prosecute my similitude, in innocent men, spiritual reason was absolutely master, and fleshly sense was an obsequious servant, though yet it had been an appetite which needed government and restraint. In wicked men, the fleshly sense and appetite is master, and reason is a servant, though reasons and the motions of the spirit may make some resistance. In strong Christians, spiritual reason is master, and the fleshly sense and appetite is a servant, but a boisterous and rebellious servant. Tamed according to the degrees of grace and spiritual victory, like a horse that is broken and well-ridden, but oft needs the spur, and oft the reins, so that Paul may cry out, O wretched man! In a weak Christian the spirit is master, but the flesh is mistress, and is not kept in the servitude which it was made for as it ought. Therefore his life is blemished with scandals, and his soul with many foul corruptions. He is a trouble to himself and others. The good which he doth is done with much reluctance and weakness, and the evil which he forbears is oftentimes very hardly forborne. His flesh hath so much power left that he is usually uncertain of his own sincerity, and yet too patient both with his sin and his uncertainty, and he is many times a greater troubler of the church than any moderate unbeliever. The hypocrite or almost Christian, hath the flesh for his master, as other wicked men. But reason, and the common grace of the Spirit, may be his mistress with him, and may have so much power and respect above a state of utter servitude, as may delude him into a confident conceit that grace hath the victory, and that he is truly spiritual, when yet the supremacy is exercised by the flesh. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. He shall not be heard of the second death. He shall eat of the hidden manna. He shall have power over the nations. I will give him the morning star. I will confess him before my father and the angels. He shall be a pillar in the temple of God and go out no more. I will grant him to sit with me in my throne. And that concludes the reading of the preface. I will now get into the meat of the matter. Part 1. Exposition of the text and exhortations grounded on it. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7. 
As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. As ministers are called in God's word the fathers of those that are converted by their ministry, so are they likened thus far to mothers, that they travail, as in birth of their people's souls, till Christ be formed in them. As Christ saith, A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So while we are seeking and hoping for your conversion, and are as in travail of you till you are born again, not only our labor, but much more our fears of you, and cares for you, and compassion of you in your danger and misery, doth make the time seem very long to us. And oh, what happy men would we think ourselves, if all or the most of our people were converted. When we see but now and then one come home, we remember no more the anguish of our fears and sorrows, nor think all our labor ill-bestowed, for joy that a Christian is newborn unto Christ. But yet, for all the mother's joy, her work, care, and sorrow is not at an end as soon as, as she is delivered. Many a foul hand, many a troublesome hour, and many a waking night she must have with the child whose birth she so rejoiced in. And after that, many a year of care and labor to bring it up and provide for it in the world. And in her old age, when she expects from her children the love, honor, and thanks and comfort that was due her as a mother, and for all her labor, care, and pains, perhaps one child will prove kind, and of another she must take it well that he is not very unkind, and a third perhaps may break her heart, and yet she must still be a mother to them all. So it befalls us, when we have greatly rejoiced at the real or seeming conversion of now and then one of our hearers, our work with them is not at an end, nor may we lay aside our care and labor for them. We have for some years usually the nurse's work to do. In many a troublesome day and night, the weakness, the uncleanness, the peevish, childish exceptions, the curious and quarrelsome disposition of our beloved converts will trouble us. And after all that, when they begin to go on their own legs and think themselves sufficient for themselves without our help, many a fall and hurt they may catch, and many fallings out may they have with one another to the great trouble of themselves and us. And when they are grown up to the strength of parts and gifts, some that seemed sincere may turn prodigals or apostates, some fall a quarreling, about the inheritance and make the most woeful divisions in Christ's family. And some perhaps despise us that have thus spent our days in strength, in studies, prayers, fears, cares and labors for their salvation. Yea, perhaps be ready to treat us with contempt and reproach our persons, yea, in our very office and calling itself, as the experience of these times of ours, seconding the experience of all ages of the church before us, doth, alas, too evidently and openly testify. Yet, some will be faithful and constant, and thankful to Christ and us, and that all might be so, for Christ's sake and for their own, must still be our care, desires, and endeavors. In these several cases, we find blessed Paul with his children, in his epistles, sometimes rejoicing with them in their steadfastness, sometimes defending himself and his ministry against their unkind and childish wranglings, as with the Corinthians you may find him. Sometimes he is put, but seldom, to a severe correction of the obstinate, delivering them up to Satan, for a warning to the rest. Sometimes he is anxious to watch with them, as in their sickness, when they are infected with some dangerous error or other disease, and is brought even to make great question of their lives lest he hath labored for them in vain, and themselves have run in vain, unless they be fallen from grace, and Christ should profit them nothing. 
receiving himself no better requital of all his laborers from them that once would have pulled out their eyes for him than to be taken for their enemy because he tells them the truth and the more he loves them the less to be loved of them but with the most we find him as one that is yet between hope and fear of them directing and exhorting them to spiritual steadfastness, growth, and perseverance to the end. And this is the work which we were to find upon him with the Colossians in this text, which contains, one, a supposition of a work, the great work already done, that is, they have received Christ Jesus the Lord, two, an inference of further duty, an exhortation thereto, which is their confirmation and progress. The parts of this duty are expressed in several metaphors. The first is taken from a tree or other plant and is called our rooting in Christ. After the receiving of Christ, there is a further rootedness in him to be sought. The second is taken from a building and is called a being built up in him as a house is upon the foundation. All the work is not done when the chief cornerstone and foundation is laid. The third part is taken from those pillars and stronger parts of the building, which are firm upon the foundation, and it is called a being established or confirmed in faith. Having made mention of faith, lest they should hearken to innovations and the conceits of men under the pretense of faith, he adds, as you have been taught, to show them what faith or religion it is, that they must be established in, even that which by the apostles they had been taught. And lastly, he expresses the measure that they should aim at, in one special way in which their faith should be exercised, abounding therein with thanksgiving. The matter is not great whether we take the relative to refer to Christ and read it with the vulgar Latin abounding in him with thanksgiving, or as the Ethiopian abound with thanksgiving to him, or whether we take it as relating to thanksgiving itself, as the Arabic translator and some Greek copies have it, abounding in thanksgiving, or abounding in such thanksgiving, or as the ordinary Greek copies and the Syriac translator, referring it to faith, abounding in it, that is, in that faith with thanksgiving. For in the end, it comes to the same, to abound in Christ, and to abound in faith in Christ, and to abound in a believing thanksgiving to Christ. All this is generally comprehended in walking in Christ, the whole life of a Christian being divided into these two parts, receiving Christ and walking in Him. Here are these several terms, therefore, briefly to be opened. Number one, what is meant by receiving Christ Jesus the Lord? Number two, what is meant by walking in him? Number three, what by being rooted in him? Number four, what by being built up in him? Number five, what by being confirmed or established in the faith? Number six, what by this directive limitation as ye have been taught? And lastly, number seven, what by abounding therein with thanksgiving? For the first, you must observe the act and the object. The act is receiving. The object is Christ Jesus the Lord. To receive Christ is not only, as some annotators mistake it, to receive his doctrine, though it is certain that his doctrine must be received, and that the rest is implied in this. But when the understanding receives the gospel by assent, the will also accepts or receives Christ as he is offered by consent. And both these together are the receiving of Christ, that is, the true justifying faith of God's elect. It is not, therefore, a physical passive reception, as wood receives the fire and as our souls receive the graces of the Spirit, but it is a moral reception, which is active and metaphorical. This will be better understood when the object is considered, which is Christ Jesus the Lord. To receive Christ as Christ, or the anointed Messiah, and as the Savior and our Lord, it is to believe that he is such, and to consent 
that he be such to us and to trust in him and resign ourselves to him as such. The relation we indeed receive by a proper passive reception, I mean our relation of being the redeemed members, subjects, and disciples of Christ. But the person of Christ we only receive by such an active moral reception, as a servant by consent receives a master, a patient by consent receives a physician, a wife by consent receives a husband, and a scholar or pupil by consent receives a teacher or tutor, or the subject by consent receives a sovereign. So that it is the same thing that is called receiving Jesus the Lord and believing in him as it is expounded. There are three great observable acts of faith essential to it. The first is assent to the truth of the gospel. The second, consent or acceptance of Christ and life as the offered good. And the third is affiance for Christ for the accomplishing of the ends of his office. Now the word faith doth most properly express the first act and the last, and the word receiving doth most properly express the middle one. But whichever term is used, when it is justifying faith that is spoken of, all three are intended or included. By what hath been said, you may discern whether you have received Christ or not, for faith may be known by these acts, which are its parts. 1. If you sincerely believe the gospel to be true, which must be with a belief so strong at least as that you are resolved to venture your happiness upon this belief and let go for all the hope that is set before you. 2. If an offered Christ in his relation as a full and perfect Savior be heartily welcome to you, if you consent to the gospel offer and are but truly willing to be his, and that he be yours in that relation. Faith is not only called a receiving of Christ, but is often expressed by this term of willing him. Therefore, the promise is to whosoever will, and the wicked are denied a part in Christ because they will not have him reign over them, or will not come to him that they may have life, even because they would have none of him, which is because they are not true believers or disciples of Christ. 3. If you thus, by consent, take Christ for your Savior, Teacher, and Lord, it must needs follow that you steadfastly rely upon Him, or trust Him to accomplish the ends of His relations, that you trust to Him for deliverance from guilt, power, and punishment of sin, and for quickening and strengthening and preserving grace and for everlasting life, that you resign yourselves up to him as to his disciple to learn of him with a confidence or trust that he will infallibly teach you the way of happiness that you also give up yourselves to him as his subjects with a trust that he will govern you in truth and righteousness in order to your salvation and will defend you from destroying enemies this much is of the very being of faith or the receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. And these parts are inseparable. He that hath one in truth hath all. Whenever we find in Scripture the promise of justification or salvation made to us, if we believe, it is this believing and none but this that is intended. It is not only believing in Christ as a sacrifice or priest, that is the faith which justifies in believing in him as a teacher or Lord that sanctifies, the effects are not thus parcelled out to several essential parts of this same faith, but it is this one entire faith in all these essential parts that is the undivided condition of all these benefits, and in that way of a condition of the free promise, it doth procure them. So much for the meaning of the first words, receiving Christ Jesus the Lord. I will be more brief about the next. The second is walking in him which is no more but the living as Christians, when once we are become Christians, and using that Christ to the ends which we received him for, when once we have received him. Two things are necessary to such as we that have lost our way. 
the first is to get into the right way, and that is to get into Christ, who is the way. The other is to travel on when we are in it, for it is not enough to bring us to our journey's end that we have found out the right way. The next word to be explained is rooted, which doth not intimate that any are really planted into Christ without any rooting in him at all. But by rooted is meant deeply rooted, for the roots increase underground as well as the tree above ground. Rooting hath two ends, and both are here implied. The first is for the fibers of the tree, that fierce winds may not overturn it. The second is for nutriment, that it may receive the nourishment from the earth which may cause its preservation, growth, and fruitfulness. This is the rootedness of Christians in Christ, that they may be confirmed in him against all assaults and may draw from him that nutriment that is necessary to their growth and fruit. The next term is built up in him. No house consists of a bare foundation. Five things are expressly contained in our being built up in him. The first is that we are united or conjoined to him as the building is on the foundation. The second is that we rest wholly on him as our support as the building doth on the foundation. The third is that we are also conjoined one unto another and are become one spiritual building in the Lord. The fourth is that the fabric doth increase in size as the house doth by being built up, so that it imports our increase in grace and increase of the church by us. The fifth is the fitness of the building to its intended ends and use. Till it be built up, it is not fit for habitation. Until Christians are built up, God hath not that use of them which he doth intend them. The next term is established or confirmed in the faith, which signifies that strengthening and fixing of us that may prevent our fall or shaking. And it compromises these two things. First, that we be found bottomed on Christ, who is our foundation. And secondly, that we may be cemented or firmly joined to each other. This comprehends their stability in the doctrine of faith, and therefore he adds, as ye have been taught, to fortify them against heresies, which are indeed all but novelties, that they may know how to try the doctrines that afterwards should be offered to them, and stick fast to that which the apostles taught. He next requires them to abound therein, to let them know that as it is no small matter that they accept by Christ, so they should not rest in small degrees of grace or duty, but especially the duty of thanksgiving, which is an evangelical and celestial duty, and so admirably beseems a people who have partaken of such admirable salvation and is so suitable to our mercies and our condition and God's just expectation. As it is love and grace whose eternal praise is designed by the gospel and are magnified in the church by the Redeemer's great and blessed work, so it is returns of love, praise, and joy that should be the most abounding or overflowing part of all our Christian affections and performances. After this explication, you may see that the sense of the text lies plain in this proposition. Doctrine. Those that have savingly received Christ Jesus the Lord must be so far from resting here, as if all were done, that they must spend the rest of their days in walking in Him, being rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as the apostles taught it, and abounding in it, especially with joyful praises to our Redeemer. Because that my design is only to direct young Christians how they may come to be established and confirmed in Christ, I shall therefore pass over all other things that the full handling of this text requires. I shall only give you, one, a short intimation here what this confirmation and stability is, which shall be more fully open to you in the directions. Two, show you the need of seeking it. And three, 
how you may attain it. Number one, this confirmation is the habitual strength of grace distinct from present actual confirmation by the influence of grace from God. For though God may in an instant confirm a weak person against some particular temptation by his free assistance, yet that is not it which we here speak of, but habitual confirmation in a state of grace. And ordinarily, we may expect that God's cooperating, assisting grace should bear some proportion with our habitual grace. Even as in nature he concurs with the strongest men to do greater works than he causes the weak to do, and with the wisest men to understand more than the foolish do, I say, but that ordinarily it is thus. A confirmed Christian, as contrary to a weak one, number one, is not to be judged by his freedom from all scruples, doubts, or fears. Number two, nor by his eminency in men's esteem or observation. Three, nor by his strength of memory. Four, freedom of utterance in praying, preaching, or discourse. Five, or by his seemly deportment and courtesy towards others. Six, nor by his sedate, calm, and lovely temper and freedom from some haste and heats which other tempers are more prone to. 7. Nor by a man-pleasing and dissembling faculty to bridle the tongue when it would open the corruption of the mind and to suppress all words which would make others know how bad the heart is. There are many endowments laudable and desirable which will not show so much as sincerity and grace and much less a state of confirmation and stability but confirmation lies in the great degree of all those graces which constitute a Christian, and the great degree appears in the operations of them, as one, when holiness is as a new nature in us, gives us a promptitude to holy actions, and makes us free and ready to them, and makes them easy and familiar to us, whereas the weak go heavily and can scarcely drive on and force their minds. Number two, when there is a constancy or frequency of holy actions, which shows the strength and stability of holy inclinations. Number three, when they are powerful to bear down oppositions and temptations, can get over the greatest impediments in the way, make an advantage of all resistance, and despise the most splendid baits of sin. Number four, when it is still getting ground, in drawing the soul upward and nearer to God, its rest and end, when the heart grows more heavenly and divine and a stranger to earth and earthly things. Number five, when holy and heavenly things are more sweet and pleasant to the soul and are sought and used with more love and pleasure. All these show that the operations of grace are more vigorous and strong and consequently that the habits are so also. This confirmation should be found, number one, in the understanding, number two, in the will, and number three, in the affections, and lastly, four, in the life. Number one, when the mind of a man hath a larger comprehension of the truths of God, and the order, method, and usefulness of every truth, with a deeper apprehension of the certainty of them, and of the goodness of the matter expressed in them, when knowledge and faith come nearest unto sight or intention, and we have a full, true, firm, and most certain apprehension of things revealed and unseen, when the nature, the reasons, the ends and benefits of the Christian religion are all most clearly, orderly, decently, and constantly, and powerfully printed on the mind, then is that mind in a confirmed state. 2. When the will is guided by such a confirmed understanding, and is not foolishly resolved, he knows not for what or why, when light hath fixed in it such resolutions as are past all notable doubtings, deliberations, waverings, or unwilling backwardness, and a man is in seeking God in his salvation, and avoiding known sin, as a natural man is about the questions 
whether he should preserve his life and make provision for it, and whether he should poison or famish or torment himself. When the inclination of the will to God, heaven and holiness, are likest to its natural inclination to do good as good, and to its own felicity. And its action is so free to have the least in determination, and to be likest to natural necessary acts, as those are of blessed spirits in heaven. When the least intimation from God prevails, and the will doth answer him with readiness and delight, and when it takes pleasure to trample upon all opposition, and when all that can be offered to corrupt the heart, and draw it to sin, and loosen it from God, prevails, but as so much dust and dross would do. This is a confirmed state of the will. Number three. When the affections proceed from such a will, and are ready to assist, excite, and serve it, and to carry us on in necessary duties, when the lower affections of fear and sorrow cleanse, restrain, and prepare the way, and the higher affections of love and delight adhere to God, and desire, and hope, make out after him, and set the soul on just endeavors, when fear and grief have less to do, and are delivering up the heart still more and more to the possession of holy delight and love, and when those affections, which are rather profound, than very sensible immediately towards God himself, are sensible towards his word, his servants, his graces, and his ways and against all sin. Then are the affections, and so the man, in a confirmed state. Number four. When ourselves, our time, and all that we have are taken to be God's, and not our own, and are entirely and unreservedly resigned to him and use for him, when we study our duty, and trust him for our reward, when we live as those that have much more to do for heaven than for earth, and with God than with man or any creature, when our consciences are absolutely subjected to the authority and laws of God, and bow not to competitors, when we are habitually disposed, as his servants, to be constantly employed in his works and make it our calling and business in the world, as judging that we have nothing to do on earth, but with God or for God. When we keep not up any secret desires and hopes of worldly felicity, nor pursue the pleasure of the flesh under the cloak of faith and piety, but subdue the flesh as our most dangerous enemy, and can easily deny its appetite and concupiscence. When we guard all our senses, and keep our passions, thoughts, and tongues in obedience to the holy law, when we do not inordinately set up ourselves in our esteem or desire above or against our neighbor and his welfare, but love him as ourselves, seek his good, and resist his hurt as heartily as our own, and love the godly with the love of complacence, and the ungodly with a love of benevolence, though they be our enemies. When we are faithful in all our relations and have judgment to discern our duty, that we run not into extremes in skill and readiness and pleasure in performing it, and patience under all our suffering, this is the life of a confirmed Christian. In various degrees, their strength is various. I shall now proceed to persuade such to value and seek this confirmation, lest with dull, unprepared minds my following directions should be lost, and then I shall give you the directions themselves, which are the part that is principally intended. First, for the motives. 1. Consider that your first entrance into Christianity is an engagement to proceed. Your receiving Christ obliges you to walk and grow up in Him. A fourfold obligation your very Christianity lays upon you, to grow stronger, and to persevere. 1. The first is, from the very nature of it, even from the office of Christ, and the use and the ends to which we receive him. You receive Christ as a physician of your diseased souls, and doth not this engage you to go on to use his medicines till you are cured? What do men choose a physician for but to heal them? 
it were but a foolish patient that would say, Though my disease be deadly, yet, now I have chosen the best physicians. I have no more to do. I doubt not of recovery. You took Christ for a Savior, which engages you to use his saving means and submit to his saving works. You took him for your teacher and master and gave up yourselves to be his disciples. And what sense was in all this if you did not mean to proceed in learning of him? It is a silly conceit for any man to think that he is a good scholar merely because he hath chosen a good master or tutor without any further learning of him. When Christ sent out his apostles, it was for these two works, first, to disciple nations and baptize them, and then to go on in teaching them to observe all things whatsoever he commanded them. Christ is the way to the Father, but to what purpose did you come into this way, if you meant not to travel on in it? Number two. Moreover, when you became Christians, you entered into a solemn covenant with Christ, and bound yourselves by a vow to be faithful to him to the death, and this vow is upon you. It is better not to vow than to vow and not perform. And taking him to be the captain of your salvation, and lifting up yourselves under him, and taking this oath of fidelity to him, you did engage yourselves to fight as faithful soldiers under his conduct and command to your life's end. And as it is foolish as a soldier who thinks that he hath no more to do but list himself and take colors and need not fight, so it is a foolish and ungodly professor who thinks he hath nothing to do but to promise and may be excused from performance because that promising was enough when the promise was purposely to bind him to perform. Number three. Moreover, when you became Christians, you put yourselves under the laws of Christ, and these laws require you to go further till you are confirmed, so that you must go on or renounce your obedience to Christ. Number four. Lastly, when you became Christians, you received such exceeding mercies as oblige you to go much higher in your affections and much further in your obedience to God. A man who is newly snatched as from the jaws of hell and hath received the free forgiveness of his sins and is put into such a state of blessedness as we are must needs feel the abundance of obligations upon him to proceed to stronger resolutions and affections and not to stop in those low beginnings. So that, if you lay these four things together, you will perceive that the very purpose of your receiving Christ was that you might walk in him and be confirmed and built up. 2. Consider also that conversion is not sound if you are not heartily desirous to increase. Grace is not true if there be not a desire after more. Yea, if you desire no perfection itself, an infant is not born to continue an infant, for that were to be a monster, but to grow up unto manhood. As the kingdom of Christ in the word is likened by him to a little leaven and to a grain of mustard seed in the beginning, which afterward makes a wonderful increase, so his kingdom in the soul is of the same nature too, if you are contented with that measure of holiness that you have, you have none at all, but a shadow and conceit of it. Let those men think of this, that stint themselves in holiness, and plead for a moderation in it, as if it were intemperance or fury to love God or fear Him, or seek Him or obey Him any more than they do, or as if we were in danger in excess of these, if ever these men had feelingly and ex by experience known what holiness is, they would never have been possessed with such conceits as these. 3. Consider what abundance of labor hath been lost, and what hopes have been frustrated for lack of proceeding to a rooted confirmation. 
I say not that such were truly sanctified, but I say they were in a very hopeful way and went far, and by going further might have attained to salvation. The heart of many a minister hath been glad to see their hearers humbled, bewailing sin, changing their minds and lives, and becoming forward professors of godliness. When a few years' time hath turned all this joy into sorrow, and one of our hopeful seeming converts doth grow cold, and lose his former forwardness, another falls to desperate sensuality, and turns drunkard, or fornicator, or gamester, another turns worldling, and drowns all his seeming zeal in the love of riches and the cares of this life, and another, if not many to one, is deluded by some deceiver, and infected with some deadly errors, casts off duty, and sets himself like a hired instrument of Satan to divide the church, oppose the gospel, reproach, slander, and rail at the ministers and professors of it, to weaken the hands of the builders, strengthen the ungodly, and serve the secret enemies of the truth. Those that once comforted our hearts in the hopes of their conversion break our hearts by their apostasy and subversion and become greater hindrances to the work of Christ and greater plagues to the church of God than those that never professed to be religious. Those that were wont to join with us in holy worship and went up with us to the house of God as our companions do afterwards despise both worshipers and worship. Whereas, if these men had been rooted and confirmed, you should never have seen them fall into this misery. Oh, how many prayers, confessions, and duties do these men lose? How many years have some of them seemed to be religious, and after all, they have proved apostates? And the world, the flesh, and pride, and error swallow up all. See then what need you have to be rooted and confirmed and built up in Christ. 4. Consider also how much of the work your salvation is yet to do when you are converted. You have happily begun, but you have not finished. You have hit on the right way, but you have your journey to go. You have chosen the best commander and fellow soldiers, but you have many a battle yet to fight. If you are Christians indeed, you know yourselves that you have many a corruption to resist and conquer many a temptation yet to overcome, and many a necessary work to do. There is a necessity for these afterworks as well as of the first. For these are the use and end of your conversion, that you may live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. How can infants go through all these works? Which of you would desire an infant or cripple to be your servant? But though God be in this more merciful than man, yet he may well expect that you should not be always infants. What work are you like to make him in this desperate and weak condition? O oh, pitiful blindness, that any man who knows that he hath a soul to be saved should think an infant's strength proportionable to those works and difficulties that stand between him and everlasting life. In the matters of this life you feel the need and worth of strength. You will not think an infant fit to plow or sow, reap or mow, or travel, or act the soldier, and yet you will rest satisfied with an infant's strength to do these great and matchless works which your salvation lies on. 5. Moreover, the weak and unconfirmed souls are usually full of trouble, and live without that assurance of God's love, and that spiritual peace and comfort which others possess. One would think no other argument should be necessary to make men weary of their spiritual weaknesses and diseases than the pain and trouble that always attend them. It is more a pain to a sick man to travel a mile than to a sound man to go ten. To the lame or feeble, every step hath pain, and all that they do is grievous to them, 
when far more would be a recreation to one that is in health. O oh, therefore, delight not in your own languishings. Choose not to live in pain and sorrow, but strive after confirmation and growth in grace, that overgrowing your infirmities, you may over overcome your sad complaints and groans, and may be acquainted with the comfortable life of the confirmed. O oh, how roundly and cheerfully would you go through your work, how easy and sweet and profitable would it prove to you if once you were strong, confirmed Christians. Alas, the souls of those that are not confirmed lie open to every temptation of the malicious enemy of their peace. How small a matter will disquiet and unsettle them, every passage in Scripture which they understand not and which seems to make against them will disturb them. A minister cannot preach so plainly or cautiously, but somewhat which they understand not will be the matter of disquiet. Providences will trouble them because they understand them not. Afflictions will be bitter to the mind as well as to the body and will immoderately perplex them because they understand them not or have not the strength to bear them and improve them. The sweeter mercies of prosperity will much lose their sweetness for lack of holy wisdom and strength to digest them. What man would choose such a weak and languishing state as this before a confirmed healthful state? Will you run up and down for a physic when you are sick? Will you no more regard the health and stability and spiritual peace and vigor of your souls? 6. Moreover, it is to the strong, confirmed Christian that hath the true use and benefits of all God's ordinances. The meat is digested by the healthful stomach, and it is seen upon them. We used to say it is not lost, it is sweet to them and doth them good and they are strengthened more by it. So is the confirmed Christian by God's ordinances. But to the weak, unconfirmed soul, how much of the means of grace is even as lost? How little sweetness do they find in means, and how little goods they say they get by them? I deny not, but some good they get, and that they must use them still, for though the sick have little relish of his meat, yet he cannot long live without it, and though it breed not strength or health, yet it maintains languishing life. But this is all, or almost all. What a sad thing is this to yourselves and unto us, when ministers that are as the nurses of the church, or stewards of the household, to give them all their meat in due season, must see that all they ever can do for you will do no more than keep you alive. Yea, how often... Are you quarreling with your food, and you do not like it? Or you cannot get it down, something still ails it for matter or manner? Or else if the minister displease you, your feeble stomach loathe the food, because you like not the cook that dresses it, or because his hands are not so clean as you desire. The full soul loathed in honeycomb, but to the hungry every bitter thing is sweet. Or if you get it down, you can hardly keep it, but are ready to cast it up to our faces. Thus a great deal of our labor is lost with you, holy doctrine lost, and sacraments and other ordinances lost, because you have not the strength to digest them. Labor, therefore, to be established and built up. 7. I beseech you, look upon the face of the world, and see whether it have not need of the strongest help, whereas the weak and sick are burdensome to others rather than fit to help the distressed. There are a multitude among us and abroad in the world that are ignorant and ungodly and in the depth of misery. And if there be but a few to help them, those few should not be babes. Abundance of this multitude are obstinate in their sin, blind and willful, captivated by the devil and have sold themselves to do evil. And shall such miserable souls as these have none but children or sick folks to help them? I tell you, their diseases prove too hard for the most skillful physicians. It will put the wisest man in England to it, to persuade one obstinate enemy of godliness to the hearty love of a holy life, or to cause one old superstitious person of his self-conceitedness or one covetous person of his love of the world, 
or one old drunkard or glutton of his sensuality. How then will silly, ignorant Christians be able to persuade them? I know it is not the ability of the instrument, but the will of God that is the principal cause, but yet God uses to work by instruments according to their fitness for the work. What a case is that hospital, and where are all sick, and no healthful persons among them to help them? Poor, weak Christians. You are not able much to help one another, how much less to help the dead, ungodly world. Woe to the world if it had no better helpers, and woe to yourselves if you had not the help of stronger than yourselves, seeing it is God's way to work by means. Alas, a child or sick person is so unfit to labor for the family and to work for others, that they are the burdens of the family and must be provided for by others. They are so unmeet to help others in their weakness that they must be carried or attended and waited on themselves. What a life is this, to be the burdens of the church when you might be the pillars of it, to be so blind and lame when you might be the eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I speak not this to extenuate God's mercies to you, nor to undervalue the great felicity of the saints, even the poorest and weakest of them. I know that Christ is the tender of the weakest that are sincere and will not forsake them. But though you are so far above the dead world, even in the bed of your groaning and languishing, yet, oh, how far are you below the confirmed healthful Christian? You are happy in being alive, but you are unhappy in being so diseased and weak. You are happy in being of the family and fellow citizens with the saints, but you are unhappy in being so useless, unprofitable, and burdensome. For indeed you live, but as the poor of the parish, not only on the alms of Christ, for so do we all, but on the alms of your brethren's assistance and support. I know that in worldly matters, you will rather labor with your hands that you may get to them that need than to be troublesome to others and live upon charity. I know that the time is not yet come that there shall not be a beggar in Israel. I mean, one that needs not our continual relief. The poor we shall always have with us. Even the poor in grace to exercise our charity. I know that the strong must bear with their infirmities and exercise compassion on them, but yet you should remember the words of Christ. It is more honorable to give than to receive. Therefore, be persuaded to bestir yourselves for spiritual health, strength and riches, than the multitudes of needy, miserable souls may have some help from you, that when they come to your doors you may not turn them away with so cold an answer. Alas, we have nothing for ourselves. Were you but a strong, confirmed Christian, what blessings might you be to all about you? What a stay to the places where you live. Your lips would feed many as the tree of life. The ear that heard you would bless you, and the eye that saw you would bear you witness. You would be to poor souls as bountiful rich men are to their bodies, the support and relief of many that are needy. You would not eat your morsels alone, nor would you see any perish for lack of clothing but the poor would bless you. Oh, pity the poor world that needs more than children's help and grow up unto confirmation. Oh, pity the poor church that abounds with weaklings, that is pestered with childish, self-conceited quarrelers and needs more than children's help and grow up to a confirmation. Oh, pity yourselves and live not still in so childish, sickly, and beggarly a condition when the way of riches and health is before you, but up and be doing till you have attained confirmation. 8. Yea, this is not all. You not only deny the church your assistance, but most of the troubles and divisions of the church are from such unsettled weaklings as you. In all ages almost, these have made the church more work than the heathen persecutors did with fire and sword. These novices, as Paul calls them, that is, young beginners in religion, are they that most commonly are puffed up with pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil. These are they that are most easily deceived by seducers 
as being not able to make good the truth, nor to confute the plausible reasonings of the adversaries. And withal, they have not that rooted love to the truth and ways of God, which should hold them fast. And they quickly yield like cowardly soldiers that are able to make but small resistance. As Paul speaks, they are like children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slate of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If you will still continue children, what better can we expect of you but thus to be tossed and carried about? Thus you gratify Satan and seducers, when you little think on it, and thus you harden the ungodly in their way, and thus you grieve the hearts of the godly, and especially of the faithful guides of the flocks. Alas, that so many of the children of the church should become the scourges and troublers of the church, and should set their teeth so deep in the breasts that were drawn out for their nourishment. If you were never drawn to do anything to the reproach of the church, yet what a grief must it be to us to see so many of yourselves miscarry? Ah, thinks a poor minister, what hopes had I once of these professors, and are they come to this? Mark the apostles' warning, be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, his way of prevention, that the heart to be established with grace. 9. Consider also that it is a dishonor to Christ that so many of his family should be such weaklings, so mutable, unsettled, and unprofitable as you are. I do not mean that it is any real dishonor to him, for if all the world should forsake him, they would dishonor themselves, and not him, with any competent judge, as it would dishonor the beholders more than the sun, if all the world should say that it is darkness. But you are guilty of dishonoring him in the eyes of the misguided world. Oh, what a reproach it is to godliness, that so many professors should be so ignorant and imprudent, so many so giddy and unconstant, so many that manifest so little of the glory of their holy profession. All the enemies of Christ without the church are not capable of dishonoring him so much as you, that bear his name and wear his livery. While your graces are weak, your corruptions will be strong. And all these corruptions will be the dishonor of your profession. Will it not break your hearts to hear the ungodly pointing at you as you pass by, to say, Yonder goes a covetous professor, or yonder goes a proud or tippling or a contentious professor. If you have any love to God in sense of his dishonor, methinks such sayings should touch you at the heart. While you are weak and unconfirmed, you will, like children, stumble at every stone, catch many a fall, and yield to many temptations, which the stronger easily resist. And then, being scandalous, all your faults by foolish men will be charged on your religion. If do but speak an ill word of another, or rail or deceive, or overreach in bargaining, or fall into any scandalous opinions or practice, your religion must bear all the blame with the world. Ever since I can remember it hath been one of the principal hindrances of men's conversions, and strengtheners of the wicked in their way, that the godly were accounted a sort of peevish, unpeaceable, covetous, proud, self-seeking persons, which was a slander as to many, but to much occasioned by the scandalous of some. Methinks you should be afraid of that woe from Christ. Woe be to him by whom offense cometh. If you be children, you may have the woe of sharp castigations, and if you be hypocrites, you shall have the woe of everlasting sufferings. The world can judge no farther than they see, and when they see professors of holiness, to be so like common men, and in some things worse than many of them. What can you expect but that they despise religion, and judge of it by the professors of it, and say, if this be their religion, let them keep it to themselves. We are as well without it as they are with it. Thus will the holy ways of God be vilified through you. If you will not excel others in the beauty of your conduct, that in this glass the world may see the beauty of your religion, you must expect that they should take it but for a common thing, which bring forth but common fruits to their discerning. You should be such that God may boast of, 
and the church may boast of, to the face of the accuser, then would you be an honor to the church. When God may say of you as he did of Job, hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. If we could say so of you to the malignant enemies, see what men the godly are. There is none such among you, men of holiness, wisdom, uprightness, sobriety, meekness, patience, peaceable and harmless, living wholly to God, as strangers on earth and citizens of heaven. Then you would be ornaments to your holy profession. Were you such Christians as the old Christians were, we might boast of you then to the reproaching adversaries. 10. Moreover, till you are confirmed and built up, you may too easily be made the instruments of Satan to further his designs. The weakness of your understandings and the strength of your passions, and especially the interest that carnal self hath remaining in you, may lay you open to temptations and engage you in many a cause of Satan to take his part against the truth. How sad a case is this? Any that have felt the love of Christ, have you been warmed with his wondrous love, washed with his blood, and saved by his matchless mercy? And may it not even break your hearts to think that after all this you should be drawn by Satan to wound your Lord, to abuse his honor, to resist his cause, to hurt his church, to confirm his enemies, and gratify the devil. I tell you with shame and grief of heart that the abundance of weak, unsettled professors that we hope have upright hearts in the main have been more powerful instruments for Satan to do his work for the hindering of the gospel, the vilifying of the ministry, the dividing of the church, and the hindering of reformation than most of the notoriously profane have been. What excellent hopes had we once in England of the flourishing of piety and happy union among the churches and servants of Christ? And who hath not only frustrated these hopes, but almost broke them all to pieces? Have any had more to do in it than weak, unstable professors of religion? What sad confusions are in most parts of England at this day by reason of the breaking of churches into sects and the contentions and reproaches of Christians against Christians and the odious abuse of holy truth and ordinances? Who is it that doth this so much as unstable professors of piety? What greater reproach almost could have befallen us than for the adversary to stand by and see men pulling out each other's eyes hating, persecuting, and reproaching one another, that our own hands should pull down the house of God and tear in pieces the miserable churches, while men are striving who shall be the master of the Reformation. Oh, what a sport is this to the devil, when he can set his professed enemies by the ears and make them fall upon one another. If he have any notable work to do against the church and cause of Christ, he can call out unstable Christians to do it. If he would have godliness to be scandalized, who hath he to do it but professors of godliness? Some of them to give the scandal, and others to aggravate and divulge it. Would he have a church divided, how quickly doth he find a bone of contention? And who should do it but the unstable members of it? Would he have the truth opposed, and error and darkness to be promoted? Who must do it but professors of the truth? Persuade some of them that truth is error, and error is truth, and the work will be done. They will furiously march out against their master, and think they do him service while they are fighting against him, scorning and shaming, if not killing his servants. Would he have public divisions maintained among all the churches of the world? It is but possessing the weaker, unstable pastors and people with a perverse zeal for mere words and notions, as if the life of the church did therein consist. And they will be the devil's instruments at a call, and carry it, perhaps by the major vote. And all that will not word it as they shall be called heretics, and the church shall have new articles added to their faith under pretense of preserving and expounding the old ones. Thus, when Satan hath a work to do, 
If heathens and infidels cannot do it, it is no more but call out Christians to do. If drunkards and malignant enemies cannot do it, it is but calling out some unstable professor of godliness to do it, and possessing the more injudicious part of the pastors with some carnal ends, or blind, consuming zeal. O Christians, in the name of God, as you would avoid these devilish employments, labor for confirming, strengthening grace, and rest not in your childish weakness and instability. If you are delivered from Satan and have truly renounced him, and tasted the great salvation of Christ, methinks you should even tremble, to consider what a thing it would be if, after all this, you should prove through your weakness so serviceable to the devil and so injurious to your dearest Lord. Must those abuse him whom he hath redeemed from condemnation? Must those hands be employed to demolish his kingdom that were washed by him and should have built it up, as if you were like Judas, that even now hath his hand with his master in the dish and presently lifts it up against him? 11. Moreover, while you are weaklings and unconfirmed, you will exceedingly encourage the ungodly in their false hopes by being so like them as you are. When they see that you excel them so little, and in many things are as bad or worse than they, it strongly persuades them that their state is as good as yours, and that they may be saved as well as others, seeing the difference seems to be so small. They know that heaven and hell are much unlike, and vastly distant, and therefore they will hardly believe that they must be thrust into hell when men who seem so little to differ from them must go to heaven. You would not believe how it hardens them in their sin when they see professors do as bad, and how it settles them in presumption and in penitency to perceive your faults. When a minister hath labored to make the sins of the ungodly odious to him, and to break his heart with the terrors of the Lord, oh, how it quiets him, and heals all again to see the like sins or others as bad in the professors of religion. If these, saith he, may be saved, for all such and such sins, what cause have I to fear? O oh, wretched, unprofitable, scandalous professors! When we have studied and preached for men's conversions many a year, you go and undo all that we have done by the scandal or levity or imprudence of an hour. When we have almost persuaded men to be Christians, you persuade them and turn them back again and do more harm by the weakness and scandal of your lives than many of us can do by good life and doctrine. When we have brought sinners even to the door of life, you prove their enemies, take them out of our hands again, and bring them back to their old captivity. Doth it not pierce your very hearts to think on it, that ever one soul, much more so many, should be shut out of glory, and burn in everlasting misery, and you should have a hand in it? Consider of this, and methinks you should desire confirming grace. 12. And methinks it should be very grievous to you to be so like the ungodly yourselves, and that Satan should still have so much interest in you. Holiness is God's image, and doth it not grieve you that you are so little like him? By his graces he keeps possession of you, and doth it not grieve you that God hath no more possession of you, but that Satan and sin should so defraud him of his own? Will he condescend to dwell low, and so low a worm, so oft defiled with the impurity of his iniquities, and doth it not wound you to think that even there he should be so straitened and thrust into corners by an implacable enemy, as if that simple habitation were too much for him, and that impure dwelling were too good for him, and as if you grudged him so much of the dregs of Satan that had taken up the beginning of your days in sin. Your corruption is the very image of the devil, and doth it not affright you? to think that you should be so like him. You are charged not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, that acceptable and perfect will of God. And yet, will you stop in a state so like to those that perish? He that hath the least measure of saving grace, 
is likest to the children of the devil of any man in the world that is not one of them. Seek, therefore, to increase. 13. I beseech you, consider that your excellency and the glory and luster of your graces is one of God's appointed means for the honor of his Son, his gospel, and church, and for the conviction and conversion of the unbelieving world. Therefore, if you use not this means, you rob God and the church of that which is their due, and deprive sinners of one of the means of their salvation. You are commanded to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Christians, be awakened to consider what you have to do with your graces. You have the living God to please and honor by them. As the excellency of the work doth honor the workmen, so must your graces and lives honor God. You have the souls of the weak to confirm by your lives and the souls of the ungodly to win by your lives. And should all be preachers and even preach as you go up and down in the world, as a candle lighteth which way ever it goes. As we are sent to save sinners, as ambassadors of Christ, by public proclamation of his will, so are you sent to save them as his servants and our helpers, and must preach by your lives and familiar exhortations, as we must do by authoritative instruction. A good life is a good sermon. Yea, those may be won by your sermons that will not come to ours, or will not obey the doctrine which they hear. Even to women that must keep silence in the church, doth Peter command this way of preaching, that if any of them have husbands that obey not the word, they may without the word be won by the conduct of the wives. Thousands can understand the meaning of a good life that cannot understand the meaning of a good sermon. By this way you may preach to men of all languages, though your tongues had never learned but one. Because a holy, harmless, humble life doth speak in all the languages of the world to men that have eyes to read it. This is the universal character and language in which all sorts may perceive. You speak the wondrous works of the Holy Ghost. I charge you, therefore, Christians, deprived not God of the honor you owe him, nor the church or souls of wicked men, of this excellent, powerful help which you owe them, by continuing in your weakness and unsettled minds and spotted lives, but grow up to that measure that may be fit for such a work. As you durst not silence the preachers of the gospel, so do not dare to silence yourselves from preaching by your holy, exemplary lives. Alas, do you think that feeble, giddy, scandalous professors are like to do any great matter by their lives? Would you wish the poor world to write after such a crooked and blotted copy? Will it win men's hearts to a love of holiness? To talk with a Christian that can scarcely speak a word of sense for his religion? Or to see a professor as greedy for a little gain as the various worldling that hath no other hope? Or to hear them rail, lie, or slander? or to see them turn up and down like a weathercock, according as the wind of temptation fits, and to follow every new opinion that is but put off with a plausible fervency? Do you think that men are likely to be won by such lives as these? 14. Do you consider of what great things you must make account to suffer for Christ? You must forsake all that you have. You must not save your lives if he bid you lose them. You must suffer with him if you will be glorified with him. You may be called to confess Christ before the kings or the judges of the earth. Then, if you deny him, he will deny you. And if you be ashamed of him, he will be ashamed of you, unless you be brought to a better state. You may be called to the fiery trial, and to suffer also the spoiling of your goods, and in a word, the loss of all. Do you think that you shall not find use for the strongest graces then? Have you not need to be confirmed rooted Christians that must expect such storms? Are infants meet for such encounters? Have you not seen how many that seem strong have been overthrown in a time of trial, and yet will you stop in a weak estate? Perhaps you will say, we cannot stand by our own strength, and therefore Christ may uphold the weakest when the strongest may fall. To which I answer, it is true. 
but it is God's common way to work by means and to imitate nature and his works of grace, and therefore he roots and strengthens those that he will have to stand and conquer, yea, and arms them as well as strengthens them, and then teaches them to use their arms. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. You must look when you are illuminated, to endure a great fight of afflictions, to be made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions, and to be companions of them that are so used. Therefore, you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. If you will endure in the time of persecution, the word must take deep root in your hearts. You must be founded on a rock if you look to stand in time of storms. In the meantime, it is a fearful thing to see, and what a wavering condition you seem to stand, like a tree that shakes as if it were even falling, or like a cowardly army that are ready to run before they fight. Like cowardly soldiers, you are still looking behind you, and a small matter of troubles perplexes and staggers you, as if you were ready to repent of your repentings. Must God have such servants as these? that upon every rumor, word, or trouble are wavering and looking back and ready to forsake him. 15. Consider also that the same reasons that moved you at first to be Christians should now move you to be confirmed thriving Christians. For they are of force as well as for this or for that. You would not have lost your part in Christ for all the world if indeed you have the least degree of grace. If the beginning be good and necessary, the increase is neither bad nor needless. If a little grace be desirable, surely more is desirable. If it was then but a reasonable thing that you should forsake all for Christ and follow him, it is surely as reasonable that you should follow him to the end, till you reach that blessedness which was the end for which at first you followed him. What, Christian? Hast thou found God a hard master, a barren wilderness to thee, or his service an unprofitable thing? Say so, and I dare say thou art a bastard, to use the apostle's phrase, and not a Christian. Some trial thou hast made of him. What evil thing hast thou found in him, or what wrong hath he ever done thee, that thou shouldst now begin to make a stand, as if thou wert in doubt? whether it be best to go further. If ever Christ were needful, he is needful still. If ever heaven and holiness were good, they are good still. Therefore, go on till thou hast obtained more and forget not the reasons that first persuaded thee. 16. Nay, more than so, you have the addition of much experience, which should be an exceeding help to quicken your affections. When you first repented and came into Christ, you had never any experience in yourselves of his saving special grace before. But you came in upon the bare hearing and believing of it. But now you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You have received at his hands the pardon of sin, the spirit of adoption, the hope of glory, which before you had not. You have had many a prayer answered, many a deliverance granted, and will you make a stand when all these experiences call you forward? Should not new motives and helps thus be added to the old, be the means of adding to your zeal and holiness? Surely wages and encouragement doth bespeak more work and diligence. Therefore, see that you increase. 17. Most, or many of you, have cause to consider how long you have already been in the family and school of Christ. If you are but newly entered, I may well exhort you to increase, but I cannot reprove you for not increasing. Alas, what a multitude of dwarfs hath Christ that are like infants at twenty or forty, 
or threescore years of age. What? Be so many years in his school and yet be in the lowest form? For when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, that by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. O oh, poor, weak, diseased Christian, hast thou been so many years beholding the face of God by faith, yet art thou no more in love with him than at the first? Hast thou been so long making trial of his goodness, and dost thou see it and savor it no more than in the beginning? Hast thou been so long under his cure, and art thou no more healed than the first year or day? Hast thou been hearing and talking of heaven so long, and yet art thou no more heavenly nor ready for heaven? Hast thou heard and talked so much against the world and the flesh, yet is the world as high in thee as at first? The flesh as strong as in the beginning of thy profession. Oh, what a sin and shame is this! What a wrong to God and thee! Yea, consider here also what means thou hast had, as well as what time. O oh, who hath gone beyond thee for power, plenty and purity of ordinances, or at least how few? Surely few parts of all the earth are like to England, for the showers of heaven and the riches of the precious ordinances of God. You have sermons till you can scarcely desire more, and that so plain that men can scarcely tell how to speak plainer, so earnest as if the servants of Christ would take no denial, even almost as if they must perish if you perished. You have as frequent, plain, and powerful books. You have the warnings and examples of the godly about you. What yet would you have more? Should a people thus fed be dwarfs continually? Is ignorance, dullness, earthliness, and selfishness excusable after all these means? Surely, it is but just that God should expect you all to be giants, even heavenly, grown, confirmed Christians. Whatever others do, it should be so with you. 18. Methinks it should somewhat move you to consider how others have advanced in less time by smaller means by far than you have had and how some of your neighbors can yet thrive by the same means that you so little thrive by. Job, who was so magnified by God himself, had not such means as you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph had none of them all such means as you. Many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things that you see and have not seen them, to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Though John the Baptist was greater than any of the prophets, yet... The least of you who are in the gospel kingdom are greater than he in respect of means. As the times of the gospel have far clearer light and give out greater measures of grace, so the true genuine children of the gospel should, taking them with one another, be far more confirmed, strong and heavenly, than those that were under the darker and scannier administration of the promise. Do you not see and hear how far you are outstripped by many of your poor neighbors who are as low in natural parts and as low in the world and the esteem of men as you. How many in this place, I dare bodily speak it, shine before you in knowledge, meekness, and patience in a blameless upright life, in fervent prayers, and a heavenly conduct. Men that have had such a need to look after the world as you and no longer time to get these qualifications and no other means but what you have had or might have had as well as they. Now, they shine as stars in the church on earth, while you are like sparks, if not like clods. I know that God is the free disposer of his graces, but yet he so seldom fails any, even in degrees that are not wanting to themselves, that I may well ask you why you might not have reached to some more eminency as well as these about you. If you had, then but been as careful and industrious as they. 19. Consider also that your holiness is your personal perfection, and that of the same kind you must have in glory, though not in the same degree. Therefore, 
If you be not desirous of its increase, it seems you are out of love with your souls and with heaven itself. When you cease to grow in holiness, you cease to go on any further to salvation. If you would indeed yourselves be perfect and blessed, you must be perfected in this holiness, which must make you capable of the perfect fruition of the most holy God, and capable of his perfect love and praise. There is no heaven without a perfection and holiness. If, therefore, you let fall your desires of this, it seems you let fall your desires of salvation. Up then and be doing, and grow as men that are growing up to glory. And if you believe that you are in your progress to heaven, being nearer your salvation than when you first believed, see then that you make progress in heavenly mindedness, and that you be riper for salvation than when you first believed. How ill doth it become men to make any stand in the way to heaven, especially when they have been in the way so long that we might have expected before this they should have been, as it were, almost within sight of it. Lastly, 20. Consider also that with little grace is little glory, and the greater measure of holiness, the greater measure will you have of happiness. I know that glory of the lowest saint in heaven will be exceeding great, but doubtless the greatest measure is unspeakably most desirable. And as it will not stand with the truth of grace for a man to be satisfied with a low degree of grace, though he plead the happiness of the lowest Christian and his unworthiness of the least degree, so at least it ill becomes an heir of glory to desire but the lowest degree of glory, though he plead the happiness of the lowest saint in heaven and his unworthiness of the lowest place. For he that will be so content with the smallest degree of glory as not to have the hearty desires of more, is accordingly content to have in himself the smallest measure of knowledge and love of God, to be loved in the smallest measure by him, to have the least enjoyment of him, and to bear the smallest part in his praises, and in pleasing and glorifying him forever. For all these things are our happiness itself. How well this agrees with the gracious frame of mind, I need not any further tell you. But, because some may question of it, whether the degree of glory will be answerable to the degree of holiness, I shall prove it in a few words. 1. It is the very drift of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. He that hath got most by improvement was made ruler proportionably over most cities. Not he that hath been the greatest bodily labor in religion, nor every one that hath passed the greatest sufferings. But he that had got the most holiness to himself and honor to God by the improvement of his talents, and so had doubled them. 2. The degrees of holiness hereafter will be diverse, as are the degrees of holiness here. For as men sow, they will reap. And there is no promise in Scripture that men will die with the smallest holiness shall be made equal to them that died with the greatest holiness. That greatest holiness hereafter must have the greatest happiness is past denial. For holiness in heaven is an essential part of the felicity itself. It is the perfection of the soul. The use of it is for perfect fruition and perfect exercise of love and praise, which are the other parts of glory. God will not give men powers, capacities, and dispositions in heaven, which shall be in vain. As he gives hungering, thirsting, and love, so will he give proportionable satisfaction and not tantalize his servants in their blessedness and leave a part of hell in heaven. Holiness is pleasing to God in its own nature. Therefore, the greatest holiness will most please him. He that most pleases God hath the greatest glory. These things are plain. 3. Moreover, we have great reason to conceive of the state of the glorified in some conformity with the rest of the workmanship of God. But in all the rest, there is a difference. Therefore, we have reason to think it is so here. On earth, there are princes and subjects in the commonwealth, and pastors and people in the churches, and several degrees among the people as to gifts and comforts. Among the devils there are degrees, and among angels themselves there are principalities and powers, thrones, and dominions. Why then should we imagine that the heavenly Jerusalem shall not be so too? 4. 
Christ plainly intimates that there is a place on his right hand and on his left to give in that kingdom, though as the Son of Man he had not the principal disposal of it. And then the kingdom must be delivered to the Father, and God be all in all. Therefore the mediator, as such, has somewhat less to do than now. When Christ tells us of Lazarus and Abraham's bosom, and of many from the east and west sitting down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he intimates to us that every place in heaven is not so high as Abraham's bosom, nor is sitting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so that I take it as a plain revealed truth that diverse degrees of holiness will have diverse degrees of glory hereafter. The chief argument to the contrary is brought from the parable of the laborers, who coming in at several hours received every one a penny. But this is misunderstood, for there is not a word in it contrary to our assertion. The parable only saith that glory shall not be proportioned to the time, but they that come later shall have nevertheless for that, which is nothing to our question about the degree of holiness. For many that are first in time may be least and last in holiness. Many that are last in time may in that little time come to be best and greatest in holiness, and consequently in glory. The parable in Matthew 25 shows that God will give different degrees of glory according to the difference in improvement of our talents. The other parable shows that he will not give out his glory according to men's time and standing in the church, seeing a weaker Christian may be one of longer standing and a stronger one of a later coming in. What show of discord is there between these? Yet it is doubtful in the judgment of good expositors whether the parable of the penny speak of heaven at all or not, or whether it speak not only of the calling of the Gentiles and taking them into the gospel church in equality with the believing Jews, though the Jews, being God's ancient people, had been longer in the vineyard, and the Gentiles were called but at the eleventh hour. Yet God will make the Gentiles equal in the grace of calling, because... In this he hath not engaged himself, but may do with his own as he will. Whichever of these two is the thing intended in the text, or possibly both, it is certain that this general is the sum of the parable, that the first may be last, and the last first. That is, that God will not give men the greatest reward that were first called, but he never said that he would not reward them most that had done him the truest service and were highest in holiness objection. But the reason is, may I not do as I will with my own? True, but you must remember what it is a reason of, even of the cause in question, and may not be by you extended to other causes without a warrant. You never read that he equally pardons the believer and the unbeliever, or saves the regenerated and the unregenerated, and then gives this reason of it, may I not do what I will with my own. For this can be no reason for anything, which he hath revealed that he will not do. Prove first that he will do it, and then bring your reasons why, but not before, so that it extends not to the case of different glory upon different degrees of holiness. For this he hath revealed that he will do. So much to satisfy the doubtful, now I desire to return to the dull and languishing Christian, and beseech him to remember what a difference there will be, between one saint and another in glory. Oh, who would not aspire after the highest measure of holiness in hope of a high degree of glory? Christian, hast thou not infinitely greater love God with the greatest love than with a less and be beloved again with the greatest of his love? I mean, by partaking of the greatest effects of it and the fullest sense of his everlasting favor. Remember this, and surely it will persuade thee to gird out thy loins and run as for the incorruptible crown, and press on to the mark for the prize of the high calling, and not to sit down with the weak beginnings, especially when the way is so sweet as well as the end. The greatest holiness hath here also the greatest spiritual reward, and it is attended with the greatest peace and joy in the ordinary course of God's dispensations. When all the knocks, falls, and cries of Christians in this life proceed from the childish weakness of their spirits, almost all the woes and calamities that attend us 
our shames, our pains, our contentions and divisions, and the lamentable difficulty that seems to be an impossibility of healing them or preventing more. All is from the corruptions that are the companions of our weaknesses. Could we but grow up to a manhood of understanding, humility, meekness, self-denial, and the love of God in Christ and of one another, we might then have some hope of the cure of all. Alas, that men who are so sensible of the difference between a weak body and a strong, a sick and sound, a child and a man, an idiot and a man of wisdom, though all of them have human nature, should yet be so little sensible of the great difference between a weak Christian and a strong, a sick and a sound, a childish and a manly, wise, confirmed Christian. Did you well know the difference you would show us that you make a greater matter of it? Now, Christian reader, I entreat thee soberly to consider of these twenty motives, whether they do not show thee reason enough to move thee to look after higher things and not to stay in an infancy of holiness. It is a blessed mercy, I confess, that God hath given thee a true conversion and the smallest measure of the heavenly life. I do not move thee to undervalue it, nay, I am blaming thee for undervaluing it. For if thou didst not undervalue it, thou wouldst earnestly desire more. Thou hast cause to bless God to all eternity, and to all eternity thou shalt bless him for making thee a new creature, even a living member of his Son. And I know that thy condition is unspeakably better than the greatest princes or emperors upon earth that is void of holiness. I know that thou hast still ground of exceeding consolation. I am not taking thy comforts from thee. I know God despises not the small day of things, and that Christ will not quench the smoking flax, nor break the bruised reed, nor cast off the poorest infants of his family, or lose any one of the lambs of his flock. But yet for all this I must tell thee, that there is a great deal of difference in excellency, strength, comfort, and happiness between one sanctified person and another. And if thou be so apt to be over-covetous of worldly riches where God forbids it, and limits thy desires, and where there is no such necessity or excellency to entice thee, why shouldst thou not cherish that holy covetousness which God expressly commands thee? Covet earnestly the best gifts, in which he hath promised a blessing to. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is not spoken of them that have no righteousness, but of them that have it, and would have more. For there is no such promise made to any that are short of saving faith. It is not any common grace that God makes this promise to, but a special grace. It is evident that no man can thus hunger and thirst after righteousness without righteousness. For even this hungering and thirsting is a degree of true sanctification. You would not take up with a cottage or smoky cabin if you could have a palace, nor with dry bread if you could lawfully have plenty, nor with a torn or threadbare coat if you can have better, nor with a poor, laborious, toilsome life in disgrace and the reproach of men if you could have honor, ease, and abundance. And yet, Will you take up with so poor a stock of holiness, so dark a mind, so small a measure of heavenly light, and so cold a love to God and glory, and so barren and common a kind of this life? God hath commanded you, that having food and raiment, you should therewith be content. But he never commanded you, that being once converted, and made an infant in grace, you should be therewith content. So content you must be as not to murmur, but not so content as not to desire more. You can see the difference. I doubt not in others between a little grace and more. Oh, that you would but see this for yourselves. If you have a froward wife, or husband, or child, who hath a harsh and passionate nature, and hath so much grace, only as to lament this when they are calmed, and to strive against it, but not to forbear the frequent exercise of it, Though such a nature may be pardoned to the penitent, yet it may prove such a thorn in your own side and such a smoke or continual dropping in your own house as will make you weary of it. I have often known men that had wives of so much folly, passion, and unruliness of tongue that yet they hoped had some saving grace that made them even a weary of their lives 
and wish that they had met with a gentle nature. And methinks you should know that corruption in yourselves is much more dangerous and harmful to you than any that can be in wife or a husband, and should be much more offensive, wearisome, and grievous to you. It is a desperate sign of a bad heart that can bear with corruption in themselves and cannot bear with it in a wife or husband, or those that do them wrong by their corruptions. If weakness of grace leave your nearest friends, thus liable to wrong and abuse you and this trouble you, consider that your own weakness leaves you liable to far greater and more frequent offenses against God, and this should trouble you much more. Let me give you another instance. If you have a pastor who is truly godly, and yet is so weak that he can scarcely speak with any understanding or life the message that he should deliver, and withal as indiscreet and as scandalous as will stand grace, what good is this man like to do for all his godliness? At least you will soon see a lamentable difference between such a one and a judicious, convincing, holy, heavenly, powerful, unspotted man. Oh, what a blessing is the one to the place, and the other may be a grievous judgment, and you would be ready to run away from his ministry. Why, if there be so great a difference between a pastor and another pastor, where both have grace? Methinks you should see what a difference there is also between people and people, even where all have grace. For truly, poor ministers find this to their sorrow in their people, as well as you can find it in them. Some ministered, have a staid, confirm, judicious, humble, meek, self-denying, teachable, peaceable, and experienced people. These walk comfortably, guide them peaceably, and labor with them cheerfully. Oh, what a beauty and glory is upon such assemblies, and what order, growth, and comfort is among them. Alas, how many ministers have a flock, even of those that we hope are godly, that grieve them by their levity, or weary of them by their unteachable ignorance, or self-conceit, or hinder their labors by errors, quarrels, and perverse opposition to the truths which they do not understand, so that there is a great difference between people and people that are godly. Brethren, it is far from the desire of my heart to cast any unjust dishonor upon saints, much less to dishonor the graces of God in them. No. I take it rather for an honor to that immortal spark that it can live amongst its enemies and not be conquered and be in the waters of corruption and not be quenched. But yet I must take up a just complaint that few of us answer the cost of our redemption and the provisions of God or are near such a people as our receivings or professions require we should be. It is one of the most grievous thoughts that ever came to my heart to observe how the lives of the greatest part of professors tend to dishonor the power and worth of grace in the eyes of the world, and that the ungodly should see that grace doth make no greater a difference and do no more upon us than it doth. Yea, it is a sore temptation oftentimes to believers to see that grace doth no more in the most but that so many are still ashamed to their profession. I must confess that I once thought more highly of professors as to the measure of their grace than experience will now suffer me to think. Little did I think that they should be so unstable, so light, so giddy as to follow almost any that do but nod for them. What a dreadful sight it is to see how quickly the most odious heresies infect and destroy even the multitudes of them, and that in a moment, as soon as they appear. The grossest myths of the bottomless pit are presently admired as the light of God. If a church divider but arise, how quickly doth he get disciples? If a papist have but opportunity, he will lightly catch some as oft as he doth cast a net. If he cannot prevail barefaced, it is but putting on the visor of some other sect. Even the odious heresies of the Quakers themselves and their railings, which an honest pagan would abhor, presently find entertainment with professors. Let the matter or manner be ever so senseless, yet it is accepted. If it be but zealously put off, oh, who would have thought that our people that seem godly should be so greedy 
of the devil's baits, as to catch at anything, yea, and to devour the bare hooks. Oh, who would have thought that so many that seemed lovers of God would so readily believe every deceiver that speaks against him, if he can but do it with a pious pretense? Yea, if infidels themselves but cast in their objections, how many of our people are presently at a loss, and their faith is muddied, and they have to seek for a ministry, to seek for a church, to seek for ordinances, and to seek for a scripture, even for the gospel itself. Therefore it is the like, that they have a seek for Christ, or to seek for a religion, if not to seek for God and for heaven. O oh, sad day, that ever these things should come to pass, and that we are forced to utter them having no possibility of concealing them from the world. Were these men confirmed and established in the faith? Were these men rooted and built up in Christ? Alas, if any deceivers come among us, how few of our people are able to withstand them and defend the truth of God against them. But they are caught up by the devil's hunter, as the poor chickens by the kite, except those that fly under the wings of a judicious minister. If an Anabaptist assaults some of them, with their baptism, how few of them can defend it. Silly souls, when they find themselves nonplussed, they suspect not their own unfurnished understandings or inexperienced, unsettled hearts, but suspect the truth of God and suspect their teachers, be they ever so far behind them in knowledge and holiness. As if their teachers had misled them, whenever these unprofitable infants are thus stalled, if a papist be pled, to plead his cause with him. How few have we that can answer him? If an infidel should oppose the scripture or Christ himself, how few among us are able to defend them and solidly give proof either of the truth of scripture or of the faith that they profess? This is not all, though it is heartbreaking case. But even in their practice, alas, what remissness and what corruptions appear, how few in secret Keep any constant watch upon their hearts, and fear and abhor the approach of an evil thought. Nay, how few are they that do not leave their fancy almost common, and ordinarily even feed on covetous, proud, malicious, or lustful thoughts, and make no great matter of it, but live in it from day to day. How few keep up life and constancy in secret prayer or meditation. How few are the families where the cause and worship and government of Christ is kept up in life and honor, and where all is not dissolved into a little weary, disordered, heartless performance. Look into our congregations, and judge but by their very looks, carriage, and gestures. How many, even of those that we think the best, so much as seem to be earnest in prayer and praise when the church is upon that work, Though it be the highest and noblest part of worship, and should be done with all the heart and might, and with a participation of a kind of angelical reverence, devotion, and spirituality. If it were so, we should see it by some of the signs of reverence and affection. Yet, alas, when we think the best of them should be striving with God, or wrapped up in his praises, they but hear us pray, as they hear us preach, and think they have done fair to give us the hearing. They sit on their seats in prayer, or use some crooked leaning gesture, perhaps looking up and down about them, perhaps half asleep. But few of them with eyes and hands and hearts lifted up to heaven, behave themselves as if they believed that they had so nearly to do with God. I know reverent gestures may easily be counterfeited, but that shows that they are good when hip hypocrites think them a fit for a cover of hypocrisy. For they use not to borrow credit from evil, but from some good to be a cover to the evil. It leaves the neglects of the godly more ex inexcusable, when they will not go so far herein as hypocrites themselves, nor by their behavior in a public ordinance, so much as seem to be seriously employed with God. If we try the graces or obedience of professors, alas, how small shall we find them in the most? How little are most acquainted with the life of faith. How little they admire the Redeemer and his blessed work. How unacquainted are they with the daily use and high improvement of a Savior for access to God, support, 
and corrobation of the soul, for conveyance of daily supplies of grace and help against our spiritual enemies. How few are they that can rejoice in tribulation, persecution, and bodily distresses because of the hopes laid up in heaven, that can live upon a promise and comfortably wait on God for the accomplishment. How few live as men that are content with God alone and can cheerfully leave their flesh, credit, and worldly estate to his disposal and be content to lack or suffer when he sees it good for them. What repinings and troubles possess our minds if the flesh cannot be provided for, and if God but cross us in these worldly things, as if we had made our bargain with him for the flesh and for this world, and had not taken him alone for our portion, how few can use prosperity and riches, health, and reputation with a mortified, weaned, and heavenly mind. Nay, how few are there that do not live much to the pleasure of the flesh and pamper it, as it is indulgently under the appearance of temperance and religion, as others do in grosser ways. Do but try the godly themselves by plain and faithful reproof of their corruptions, and see how many of them you will find, that will not excuse them, and take part with the enemy, and be offended with you, for your close reproof. If any of them be overtaken with a scandalous fault, and the pastors of the church shall call them to an open confession, an expression of repentance, though you would little think a penitent man should once stick at this, and refuse to do anything that he can do to repair the honor of God in his profession, and save the souls of others whom he hath endangered. Yet, how many will you find that will add a willful obstinacy to their scandal, and will deliberately refuse so great, clear, and necessary a duty. So great is the interest of self and flesh in them, and consequently, so little the interest of Christ, that they will live in impenitency in the eye of the church, and venture on the high displeasure of God. Come of it what will, and resist the advice of their best, wisest, and most impartial friends, rather than they will so far deny themselves as to make such a free and faithful confession. They are many of them so much for holy discipline that they are ready to fall out with the church and ministers and to be gone to a purer society because it is not exercised. But on whom? On others only and not upon them. When they need discipline themselves, how impatient are they of it? And how do they abhor it? What a stir they make before they will submit. Even more sometimes than a drunkard or swearer, so small is their repentance and detestation of their sin, whereby they show that their zeal for discipline and reformation is much out of pride, that others may be brought to stoop or be cast out from them, and not out of a sincere desire to have the refining and humbling benefit of it themselves. If any among them be either faulty or reported so to be, who is a forwarder than many professors of godliness to backbite them and speak of their faults when they cannot hear nor answer for themselves, nor receive any benefit by it. And if another that hates backbiting, but reprove them, they will slander him also for a defender of men's sin. But when they should go in Christ's way, tell men of their faults, and draw them to repentance. And if they hear not, take two or three, and speak to them again. How hardly can you draw them to the performance of this duty? What shifts and frivolous excuses have they then? Nay, they will reproach the church or minister, for not casting such out, or not keeping them from communion, before they have done, or will be persuaded to do, these duties that must go before. Alas, how little hearty love is there to Christ, in his members, even in them, that are confident they love the brethren. How few will do or suffer much for them, or relieve them in their lack as suffering with them. How small a matter, a word, a seeming wrong or disrespect, will turn their love in estrangement or bitterness. If they be tried by an ill word or a wrong, how touchy, froward, and impatient do they appear. And it is well if they prove not downright malicious, or return not reveling for reveling. Alas, how much pride prevails with many that seem to go far in the way of piety. How wise are they in their own conceits. How able to judge of controversies and how much wiser than their teachers, before they can give a good account of the catechism or fundamental truths. How well do they think of themselves, 
and their own parts and performances. How ill do they bear disesteem and undervaluing, and they must needs be noted for somebody in the world. How worldly, close-handed, and eager of gain are many that say they despise the world and take it for their enemy. If any duty be cross to their profit or credit with men, how obstinate are they against it. And such interest hath the flesh in them, that they will hardly believe that it is their duty. How sincerious are they of others, especially that differ from them in lesser things, and how unapt to judge themselves. Oh, how few are the Christians that are eminent in humility, meekness and self-denial, that are content to be accounted nothing, so that Christ may be all, and his honor may be secured, that live as men devoted to God, honor him with their substance, and freely expend, yea, study for advantages, to improve all their riches and interest to his service. How few are they that live as in heaven upon earth, with the world under their feet, and their hearts above with God their happiness, that feel themselves to live in the workings and warmth of the love to God, and make him their delight, and are content with his approbation, whoever disapproveth them, that are still groaning or reaching and seeking after him, long to be with him, to be rid of sin, see his blessed face, and live in his perfect love and praises, that love and long for the appearance of Jesus Christ, and can heartily say, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. How few are they that stand in a day of trial, if they are tried but with a foul word, if tried but with anything that touches their case, if tried but with the emptiest reasonings of deceivers, much more if they be tried with the honors and greatness of the world. How few of them stand in trial, and do not fall and forget themselves, as if they were not the men that they seemed to be before. What then would they prove if they were tried by the flames? Mistake me not in all this sad complaint, as I intend not to dishonor of godliness by this, but of ungodliness. For it is not because men are godly that they have these faults, but because they are not more godly. So here is no encouragement to the unsanctified to think themselves as good as the more religious because they are charged with so many faults. Nor do I affirm all these things to be consistent with true grace that I have here expressed, but only this, that professors that seem godly to others are thus too many of them guilty, and those that have true grace may have any of these faults in a mortified degree, though not in a reigning predominant measure. But, methinks you should by this time be convinced and sensible, how much we dishonor God by our infirmities. What a lamentable case it is that the church should consist of so many infants, and so many should be of so little service to God or the common good, but rather be troublers of all about them. Alas, we should reach no higher, that yet no greater thing should be attained. Oh, what an honor would you be to your profession, and what a blessing to the church if you did but answer the cost and pains of God and man, and answer the high things that you have been acquainted with and profess, that we could but boast of you as God did of Job, and could say to Satan or any of his instruments, Here are Christians rooted and established in the faith. Try whether you can shake them or make them stagger, and do your worst. Here is a man, eminent in meekness, humility, patience, and self-denial, Discompose and disturb his mind if you can. Draw him to pride or a moderate passion or censoriousness or uncharitableness if you can. Here are a people that are in unity and knit together in faith and love of one heart, one soul, and one lip. Do your worst to divide them or break them into parties or draw them into several minds and ways or exasperate them against each other. Here are a people established in mortification and that have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Do your worst to draw them to intemperance, in eating or drinking or recreations, or any of the delights of the flesh, or to puff them up by greatness and prosperity, and make them forget themselves or God. Try them with riches, or beauty, or vain glory, or other sensual delights, and see whether they will turn aside and be ever the less in communion with God, and enticed to forget the joy that is set before them or will not rather despise your baits and run away from alluring objects as their greatest dangers. Daunt them if you can by threatenings. Try them by persecution, by fire and sword, and see whether they are not past your shaking, 
even rooted and confirmed and built up in Christ. Oh, what a glory would you be to your profession if you could attain to this degree. Could we but truly thus boast of you, we might say our people are Christians of the right strain. But when we must come about you like men in a swoon and can hardly perceive whether you are alive or dead and can scarcely discern whether you have any grace or none, what a grief is this to our hearts. What a perplexity to us in our administrations, not knowing whether comfort or terror be your due. And what a languishing, uncomfortable life is this to yourselves in comparison of what you might attain to. Rouse up yourselves, Christians, and look after higher and greater things. Think it is not enough that you are barely alive. It is an exceeding righteousness that you must have if you will be saved, even exceeding all the unsanctified attain. For except your righteousness exceed even the righteousness of scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. But it is yet a more exceeding righteousness that you must have if you will be confirmed, built up and abound, would honor your profession, and cheerfully, successfully, and constantly go on in the journey, the race and the warfare that you have begun. You must then exceed yourselves, and exceed all the feeble, unstable, wavering infant Christians that are about you, to persuade you yet further, to look after this, I shall here annex a few motives more. 1. Consider, Christian, that it is a God of exceeding, infinite greatness and goodness that thou hast to do with. And therefore, it is not a small and low matter that are suitable to his service. Oh, if thou hadst but a glimpse of his glory, thou wouldst say that it is not a common thing that are meet for such a dreadful majesty. Hadst thou but a fuller taste of his goodness, thy heart would say, this pittance of love and service is unworthy of him. You will not offer the basest things to a king, much less to the highest king of kings. If he offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if he offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Offer it now to thy governor, will he be pleased with thee, or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye have profaned it, his great name, in that ye say, The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruits thereof. Even his meat is contemptible. Ye have said also, What a weariness is it? And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye have bought that which was torn, and the lame and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrifice to the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. If you better knew the majesty of God, you would know that the best is too little for him, and trifling is not tolerable in his service. When Nadab and Abihu ventured with false fire to his altar, he smote them dead. He silenced Aaron with this reason of his judgment, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh to me, and before all the people will I be glorified. That is, I will have nothing common offered to me, but be served with my own holy peculiar service. When five thousand of the Bashemites were smitten dead, they found that God would not be trifled with, and they cried out, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? 2. Consider also, it was an exceeding great price that was paid for your redemption. For you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by your tradition from your fathers but by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. It was an exceeding great love that was manifested by God the Father and by Christ in this work of redemption, such as even perplexes angels and men to study it and comprehend it. Should all this be answered but with trifling from you? Should a matchless miracle of love be answered with no greater love, especially when you were purposely redeemed from all iniquity, that you might be sanctified to Christ, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. It being therefore so great a price that you are bought with, remember that you are none of your own, but must glorify him that bought you in body and spirit. 3. Consider also that it is not a small, but an exceeding glory that is promised to you in the gospel, and which you live in hope to possess forever. Therefore, it should be an exceeding love that you should have to it, and an exceeding care that you should have of it, to make light of heaven is to make light of all. Truly, it is an unsuitable, unreasonable thing to have one low thought or one careless word or one cold prayer or other performance 
about such a matter as eternal glory? Shall such a thing as heaven be coldly or carelessly minded and sought after? Shall the endless fruition of God and glory be looked at with sleepy, heartless wishes? I tell you, if you have such high hopes, you must have high and strong endeavors. A sloth pace becomes not him that travels to such a home as this. If you are resolved for heaven, behave yourselves accordingly. A gracious, reverent, godly frame of spirit, producing an acceptable service of God, is fit for them that look to receive the kingdom that cannot be moved. The believing thoughts of the end of all our labors must needs convince us that we should be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. O oh, hearken, thou sleepy Christian, slothful Christian, doth not God call and conscience call? Awake, up and be doing, for it is heaven. Hearken, thou negligent Christian, do not God and conscience call out to thee, O man? Make haste and mend thy pace, it is for heaven. Hearken. Thou cowardly, faint-hearted Christian, do not God and conscience call out to thee, arm, man, and see that thou stand thy ground. Do not give back, nor look behind thee, but fall on and fight in the strength of Christ, for it is the crown of endless glory. O oh, what a heart hath that man that will not be stimulated with such calls as these! Methinks the very name of God in heaven should awaken you, and make you to stir if there be any stirring power within you. Remissness in worldly matters hath an excuse, for they are but trifles, but slackness in the matters of salvation is made inexcusable by the greatness of those matters. O oh, let the noble greatness of your hopes appear in the resolution, exactness, and diligence of your lives. 4. Consider also that it is not only low and smaller mercies that you receive from God, but mercies innumerable, inestimable, and exceeding great. Therefore it is not cold affections and dull endeavors that you should return to God for all these mercies. Mercy brought you into the world, mercy hath nourished you and bred you up, and mercy hath defended and maintained you and plentifully provided for you. Your bodies live upon it. Your souls were recovered by it, it gave you your being, it rescued you from misery, it saves you from sin, Satan and yourselves. All that you have at present, you must hold by it. All that you can hope for for the future must be from it. It is most sweet in quality. What sweeter to miserable souls than mercy? It is exceeding great in quantity. The mercy of the Lord is in the heavens, and his faithfulness reaches to the clouds. His righteousness is like the great mountains. His judgments are a great deep. O oh, how great is his goodness, which he hath laid up for them that fear him, which he hath for them that trust in him before the sons of men. His mercy is great unto the heavens, and his truth unto the clouds. And O oh, what an insensible heart hath he, that doth not understand the voice of all this wondrous mercy. Doubtless it speaks the plainest language in the world, commanding great returns from us of love, praise, and obedience to the bountiful bestower of them. With David we must say, Blessed be the Lord, for he hath showed me marvelous kindness in a strong city. O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth all the faithful. Teach me thy way, O Lord, I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy towards me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Unspeakable mercies must needs be felt in deep impressions, and be so savory with a gracious soul, that methinks it should work us to the highest resolutions. Unthankfulness is a crime that heathens detested, and it is exceeding great unthankfulness if we have not exceeding great love and obedience under such exceeding great and many mercies as we possess. 5. Consider that they are exceeding great helps and means that you possess to further your holiness and obedience to God. And therefore your holiness and obedience should also be exceeding great. You have all the book of nature to instruct you. Every creature may teach you God and calls loud upon you to persuade your hearts yet nearer to him. Every work of disposing providence is an instructor and persuader of you. Every leaf and line of scripture is a guide to spur to you. 
You have ministers able and willing to help you. You have the help of the communion of the saints, the help of the examples of the good, and the warning of the judgments of God upon the wicked, the helps of the sermons, the helps of sacraments, the helps of prayer, and holy meditation and conference, mercies to encourage you, afflictions to excite you. What more would you have? Yet will you be infants and do no more with all your help? But this I touched upon before. 6. It is an exceeding great necessity that is upon you, and therefore your resolution should be exceeding high, and your diligence exceeding great. For all you are converted, your salvation lies yet upon your stability and perseverance. Christ hath reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard. God will not be an acceptor of persons. You must stick to his terms if you will partake of his salvation. He will not make two words with you. He hath told you what he expects of you, and that he will have. Death will not be bribed nor put by. Judgment is coming on. There is no shifting out of the hands of God. Under such pressing necessities as these, what Christians should we be? How stable and abundant in faith and righteousness. 7. It is a great account that you have to make, and therefore a great preparation that should be made. When you shall be brought before the living God, and all your times, thoughts, and ways must be called over, and you see what follows, and are waiting for the final doom, then there will be no dull thoughts in your hearts. All will be lively, then, and quite above this careless frame. Then even the wicked will have strong desires. Oh, that we had taken another course, that we had prevented this dreadful doom, whatever it had cost us. Should not believers now be awakened to great and careful preparations for such a day as this? 8. For trifles here are great endeavors used, to climb up into honor or the riches of the world, to satisfy the flesh, to lay up a treasure on earth, and labor for the meat that perisheth. What endeavors then should be used for the heavenly, everlasting treasure? 9. Consider also how forward and diligent should those men be that are sure they can never go too high nor be too diligent when they have done their best. Nay, that are certain that the best do come so abundantly short that they must after sit down and lament that they were no better. There is not the holiest saint on earth but will confess with lamentation how little his love to God is in comparison of what it should be. How short all falls below our duty, below the glorious majesty of God, below the precious love of Christ, below the worth of precious souls, below the weight of endless glory, below the mercies that should warm our hearts, below the great necessity that is on us, and consequently below their own desires. Look therefore after greater things while you may attain them, and lastly, Consider what abundance of great engagements are on you, who are sincere believers more than upon others. Number one, you are more nearly related to Christ than any others are. Therefore, you should be more tender of offending him and more eminent in love and service to him. You are his household servants, and will you not labor for him and stick to him? You are his friends, and should a friend abuse him, should not a friend be faithful? You are his dear adopted children and his spouse, and should you not be faithful to him to the death? Should not all the love and service that you have be his? Number two, you have bound yourselves to him by more serious frequent vows and covenants than other men have done. How many persons, places, and necessities of yours can witness against you if you be not firm and forward for the Lord? As Joshua said to Israel, behold this stone, it shall be a witness unto you, lest you deny your God. So I may say, the places where you have kneeled, prayed, and promised will be witnesses against you if you be not firm to God. The churches that you have assembled in, the places that you have walked in, in your solitary meditations, the persons that have heard your promises and professions, the world about you that hath seen your forwardness will all witness against you if you be not firm. Number three. It is you that have the life and kernel of mercies. Others have but the crumbs that fall from your tables. 
Others have common mercies, but you have the great and special mercies that accompany salvation. All things are yours, and should not you be Christ's? Of you it is that God is so exceeding tender that he charges your enemies not to touch you, and tells them that touch you that they touch the apple of his eye. Should not you abound in love and holiness? Should you not be tender of his favor and his law and honor as the apple of your eye? Should not he that touches the name, law, and honor of God by profaning them by sin be as one that touches the apple of your eye? Number four. You have a spirit and heavenly life within you, which the rest of the world are unacquainted with. Can you think it is something extraordinary that God must needs expect from you? Will you not walk in the spirit which is given you and mortify the flesh by it? Is there not more expected from the living than the dead. Surely he hath made you new creatures, and made you partakers of the divine nature, doth somewhat divine in your affections and devotions, and that you may be somewhat more than men. Number five. Moreover, it is you above others, for whom the word and messengers of God are sent. We must speak to all, but it is you that God specializes upon, and it is your salvation that he intends to accomplish by us. There were many widows in the days of Elias, and many lepers in the days of Elijah, but it was but to one of them that the prophet was sent. We make the ungodly multitude even rage against us, and ministers are hated for magnifying the grace of God to you, declaring his special love to you above others. When Christ himself had spoken the four-sided words, it is said in the next verses that they all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him to the bro of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. This was the entertainment of Christ himself, when he did but declare how few it is that God will save, and for whose sakes he specially sends his messengers. Must we incur all this for magnifying you, and will you dishonor yourselves? Is all our study and labor for you, and our lives for you, and all things for you, and will you not be holy to the utmost of your strength for God? Are you chosen out of the world for salvation, and will you not answer this admirable, distinguishing grace by an admirable difference from those that must perish, and by an admirable excellency in meekness, humility, self-denial, and heavenliness above other men? Number six. Moreover, you know more that you have a greater experience to assist you than others have. Therefore, you should excel them accordingly. Others have but heard of the odiousness of sin, but you have seen and felt it. Others have heard of God's displeasure, but you have tasted it to the breaking or bruising of your hearts. You have been warned at the very quick, as if Christ had spoken to your very flesh and bones, Go thy way and sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. As Ezra said, After all that has come upon us, should we again break thy commandments? Wouldst thou not be angry with us till thou hast consumed us? So if after all your spiritual experiences, after so many tastes of the bitterness of sin, groans, prayers, and cries against it, you shall yet live as like to the wicked as you dare, and be familiar with that which hath cost you so dear, how do you think that God must take this at your hands? You have tasted of the sweetness of the love of Christ, and wondered at the unspeakable riches of his grace. You have tasted the sweetness of the hopes of glory and of the powers of the world to come. You have perceived the necessity and excellency of holiness by inward experience. And if after all this you will grovel in the earth and live below your own experiences, contenting yourselves with an infancy of love, life, and fruitlessness, how much do you then transgress against the rules of reason and of equity? Number seven, moreover, all the world expects much more from you than from any others. God expects more from you, for he hath given you more. It means to do more for you. Must you be in the eternal joys of heaven when all your unsanctified neighbors are in torments, and yet will you not endeavor to excel them? Is it not unreasonable to expect to be set eternally at vast, so vast a distance from the ungodly world, even as far as heaven is from hell, and yet to be content to differ here but a little from them in holiness? The Lord knows that the poor, forsaken, and penitent sinners will do no better, but rage and be confident till they are past remedy. He looks for no better from them, 
than to neglect him and slight his son, his word and his ways, and to go on in worldliness and fleshly living, to be filthy still, careless, presumptuous, and self-conceited still. But it is higher matters that he expects from you, and good reason he hath done more for you and prepared for you better things. The ministers of Christ look for little better from many of their poor, ignorant, ungodly neighbors, but even to live out their days in security and self-deceit, and to be barren after all their labors, if not to hate us for seeking to have saved them. But it is you that their eyes are most upon, and you that their hearts are most upon. Their comfort and the fruit of their lives lie much in your hands. Saith Paul, Brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly, that we might see your face, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. You see here that your pastor's lives are in your hands. If you stand fast, they live. For the end of life is more than life, and your salvation is the end of our lives. If the impenitent world reproach us and abuse and persecute us, we suffer it joyfully, as long as our work goes on with you. But when you are at stand, when you are barren, scandalous, and passionate, Dishonor your profession and put us in fears, lest we have bestowed all our labor on you in vain. This breaks our hearts above any worldly crosses whatsoever. When the people that we should rejoice and glory in shall prove unruly, self-conceited, peevish, proud, everyone running his own way, falling into divisions, contentions, or scandals, this is the killing of the comforts of your ministers. When the ungodly shall hit us in the teeth with their scandals or divisions, and say, These are the godly people that you boasted of. See now what has become of them. This is the smoke to our eyes, and the gold and vinegar that is given us by the adversary. Though still we know that a reward is with the Lord, yet can we not choose but be wounded for your sakes, and for the sake of cause and name of God. Yea, the world itself expects more from you than others. When men talk of great matters and profess, as every Christian doth, to look for the greatest matters of eternity, and to live for no lower things than everlasting fellowship with God and angels. No wonder, then, if the world look for extraordinary matters from you. If you tell them of reaching heaven, they will look to see you winged like angels, and not to creep on earth like worms. If you say that you are more than men, they expect you should show it by doing more than men can do, even by denying yourselves, forgiving injuries, loving your enemies, blessing those that curse you, contemning the world, and having your conversation in heaven. Believe it, it is not a small or common thing that will satisfy the expectations of God or men, of ministers, or of the world themselves concerning you. Number eight, yea, moreover, God himself doth make boast of you. In all out of the world to observe your excellency, he sets you up as the light of the world to be beheld by others. He calls you in his word his peculiar treasure above all people, a peculiar people, purified and zealous of good works. He called you a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are as lively stones, built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You were born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, and are made meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. God hath delivered you from the power of darkness, and translated you into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom you have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and of children than heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. All things shall work together for your good. He that spared not his own son, but gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Nothing but the illuminated soul can discern the riches of the glory of God's inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the work of his mighty power. 
When we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. He hath brought us nigh that we're afar off, so that by one spirit we have access to the Father by Christ, and are now no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and of the household of God, we are members of the body of Christ. We are come to Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, the Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Brethren, shall the Lord speak all this, and more than this, in the scripture of your glory, and will you not prove yourselves glorious, and study to make good this precious word? Doth he say the righteous is more excellent than his neighbor? And will you not study to show yourselves more excellent indeed? Shall all these high things be spoken of you, and will you live so far below them all? What heinous wrong is this to God? He sticks not in the boasting of you to call you his jewels and tell the world he will make them one day discern the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. He tells the world that is coming in judgment will be to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in them that believe. It is openly professed by the Apostle John. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. He challenges any to condemn you or lay anything to your charge, professing that it is he that justifieth you, casting the saints into admiration by his love. What shall we say to these things if God be for us who can be against us? He challenges tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, to separate you if they can from the love of God. He challenges death and life, angels, principalities, and powers, things present and things to come, height and depth, and any other creature to separate you if they are able from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Shall the Lord of heaven thus make his boast of you to all the world, and will you not make good his boasting? Yeah, I must tell you, he will see that it be made good to a word. If you be not careful of it yourselves, and be not made good in you, then you are not the people that God thus boasts of. He tells the greatest persecutors to their faces that the meek, the humble, the little ones of his flock have their angels beholding the face of God in heaven, and that at that great and dreadful day of judgment they shall be set at his right hand as a sheep, with a come ye blessed, inherit the kingdom, when others are set at his left hand as goats, with a go ye cursed into everlasting fire. He tells the world that he receiveth a converted man that has become as a little child, receiveth Christ himself, and that whoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in him, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Must God be thus wonderfully tender of you, and will you not now be very tender of his interest in your duty? Shall he thus distinguish you from all the rest of the world, and will you not study to declare the difference? The ungodly even gnash the teeth at ministers and scriptures and Christ himself for making such a difference between them and you, and will you not let them see that it is not without cause? I entreat you, I require you, in the name of God, see that you answer these high commendations and show us that God hath not boasted of you beyond your worth, Number nine, consider this is the highest motive of all. God doth not only magnify you and boast of you, but also he hath made you the living images of his blessed self, his son Jesus Christ, his spirit, and his holy word. And so he hath exposed himself, his son, his spirit, and his word to be censured by the world according to your lives. The express image of the Father's person is the Son. The Son is declared to the world by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost hath indicted the Holy Scriptures, which therefore bear the image of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. This Holy Word, both law and promise, is written in your hearts and put into your inner parts by the same Spirit, so that as God hath imprinted his holy nature in the Scripture, so hath he made this world a seal to imprint again his image on your hearts. And you know that common eyes can discern better the image in the wax than on the seal. Though I know that the hardness of the wax, or something lying between, 
or the imperfect application may cause an imperfect image of the wax, when yet the image on the seal is perfect. Therefore, the world hath no just cause to censure God or Christ or the Spirit of the Word to be imperfect, because you are so. But yet they will do it, and their temptation is great. Oh, how would your prince take it of you? Or how would your poorest friend take it of you, if you should hang forth a deformed picture of them to the view of all that shall pass by, and should represent them as blind or leprous or lame, wanting a leg or an arm or an eye? Would they not say that you unworthily exposed them to scorn? So if you will take on you to be the living images of God, of Christ, of the Spirit and the Word, and yet will be blind, worldly, passionate, proud, unruly, obstinate, or lazy and negligent, and little differing from those that bear the image of the devil, what do you but proclaim that the image of God, of Satan, of the world do little differ, and that God is thus unrighteous and unholy as you are? Number 10. Lastly, consider that the faithful servants of Christ are few, and therefore if those few do dishonor him and prove not fast to him, what do you do but provoke him to forsake all the world and make an end of all the sons of men? It is but a little flock to whom he will give the kingdom. It is but to a few from whom God expects any great matter, and shall those few prove deceitful to him? It must be you or none that must honor the gospel. You or none that must be exemplary to the world. And shall it be none at all? Shall all the workmanship of God abuse him? Shall he have no honor from any inferior creature? How can you then expect that he should preserve the world? For will he be at so much care to keep up the world to a state of dishonor and to abuse him? If the turning of men's hearts prevent it not, he would come and smite the earth with a curse. For the land that beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. If therefore Israel play the harlot, yet let not Judah sin. If the vessels of wrath prepared to destruction will be blind, sensual, and filthy still, yet let pollution be far from the sanctified. Such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified. Let the Lord be magnified in his saints. Blot not out his image, receive not his impressions defectively and by halves. Let the name of the Most Holy One be written in your very foreheads, that you would be so tender of the honor of the Lord, and shine forth so brightly in holiness and righteousness, that he that runs might read whose servants you are, and know the image and superscription of God upon the face of your conversations, that as clearly as light is seen in and from the sun and the power and wisdom and goodness of God is seen in the frame of creation and of scripture. So might the same shine forth in you that you might be as holy as God is holy and perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That they would know God, that they may see him and his saints where his image is or should be so lively and discernible that they who cannot read and understand the scripture or the works of creation or disposing providence, may read and understand the holy and heavenly representation of your lives. Men are apt to look after the images of the Godhead, because they are carnal and far from God. O you who are appointed to bear his image, see that you represent him to the eyes of the world, as may be to his glory and not to his dishonor, and take not the name of God in vain. It is so desirable for God and for the church, and for your own peace and happiness, that Christians should grow up to a ripeness and grace, and be rooted, built up, and confirmed, and abound, according to my text that it hath drawn out from me all these words of exhortation thereunto. Though one would think that to men of such holy principles and experience it should be more than needs, but if all will but serve to awaken the weak to a diligent progress, I shall be glad and have my end. The great matter that I intended when I began this discourse is yet behind. That is, the giving you such directions as may attend to your confirmation and perseverance, which I shall not proceed to, but I entreat every reader who hath any spark of grace in his soul, that he will resolve to put these directions in practice, and turn them not off with a bare perusal or approbation. Let me reap but this fruit of all my foregoing exhortations, and I shall not think my labor lost. 
This has been a reading from the Practical Works of Richard Baxter, Directions to Weak Christians.